The Sound of Waves, Chapter 4. It was some four or five days later, and the wind was blowing a gale. The waves were breaking high across the breakwater of Utajima's harbour. The sea, far and wide, was choppy with white caps. The skies were clear, but because of the high wind, not a single fishing boat had gone out. Shinji's mother had asked a favour of him. The women of the village gathered firewood on the mountain and left it stored at the top in what had formerly been a military observation tower. His mother had marked hers with a red rag. Since he had finished by noon with the young men's association's work of carrying stones for the road building, she asked him to bring her gatherings down from the mountain for her. Shinji shouldered the wooden frame on which brushwood was carried and set out. The path led up past the lighthouse. As he rounded Woman's Slope, the wind died as completely as though it had been a trick. The resident of the light, the residence of the lighthouse keeper was as quiet as though in a deep noonday sleep. He could see the back of a watchman seated at the desk in the watchhouse. A radio was blaring music. Climbing the pine grove slope behind the lighthouse, Shinji began to sweat. The mountain was utterly still. Not a single human form was to be seen. There wasn't even so much as a stray dog prowling about. In fact, because of a taboo on the island's guardian deity, there was not a single stray dog on the entire island, let alone a pet dog. And as the island was all uphill and land was scarce, neither were there any horses or cows for draught animals. The only domestic animals were the cats that came trailing the tips of their tails through the jagged shadows thrown in sharp relief in the lanes leading always downward in cobbled steps between the rows of village houses. The boy climbed to the top of the mountain. This was the highest point on Utajima, but it was so overgrown with sakaki and silverberry bushes and tall weeds that there was no view. There was nothing but the sound of the sea roaring up through the vegetation. The path leading down the other side to the south had been practically taken over by bushes and weeds, and one had to make quite a detour to reach the observation tower. Presently, beyond a sand-floored pine thicket, the three-storey reinforced concrete tower came into view. The white ruins looked uncanny in the deserted, silent scene. In former days, soldiers had stood on the second floor balcony, binoculars to their eyes, and checked the aim of the guns that were fired for target practice from Mount Konaka on the far side of Irako Cape. Officers had called out from inside the tower to know where the shells were hitting, and the soldiers had called back the ranges. This way of things had continued until mid-war, and the soldiers had always blamed a phantom badger for any provisions that were mysteriously short. The boy peeped into the ground floor of the tower. There was a mountain of dried pine needles and twigs tied into bundles. This floor had evidently been used as a storehouse and its windows were quite small. There were even some with their glass panes still unbroken. The boy entered and, by the faint light of the windows, soon found his mother's mark. Red rags tied to several bundles, the name Tommy Kubu, written on them in childish characters. Taking the frame off his back, Shinji tied the bundles of dried needles and twigs to it. He hadn't visited the tower for a long time and now felt reluctant to depart so soon. Leaving the load lying where it was, he was about to start up the concrete steps. Just then, there was a faint sound from overhead as though of stone and wood striking together. The boy listened intently. The sound ceased. It must have been his imagination. He went on up the stairs, and there on the second floor of the ruins was the sea, framed desolately in wide windows which lacked both glass and casings. Even the iron railing of the balcony was gone. Traces of the soldiers' chalk scribblings could still be seen on the grey walls. Shinji continued climbing. He paused to look at the broken flagpole flagpole out a third-storey window, and this time he was certain he heard the sound of someone sobbing. He gave a start and ran lightly on up to the roof of, of on the sneaker-clad feet. The one who was really startled was the girl on the roof, having a boy suddenly appear before her out of nowhere without so much as a footfall. 
She was wearing wooden clogs and was weeping, but now she ceased her sobbing and stood petrified with fear. It was Hatsue. As for the boy, he had never dreamed of such a fortunate meeting and couldn't believe his eyes. So the two of them simply stood there, startled, like animals that had come suddenly face to face in the forest. Looking into each other's eyes, their emotions wavering between caution and curiosity. Finally, Shinji spoke. You're Hatsue-san, aren't you? Hatsue nodded involuntarily and then looked surprised at his knowing her name. But something about the black, serious eyes of this boy who was making such an effort to put up a bold front seemed to remind her of a young face that had gazed at her fixedly on the beach the other day. It was you crying, wasn't it? Yes, it was me. Why were you crying? Shinji sounded like a policeman. Her reply came with unexpected promptness. The mistress of the lighthouse gave lessons in etiquette and homemaking for the girls of the village who were interested, and today Hatsue was going to attend for the first time. But coming too early, she had decided to climb the mountain behind the lighthouse and had lost her way. Just then, the shadow of a bird swept over their heads. It was a peregrine. Shinji took this for a lucky sign. Thereupon his tangled tongue came unloose, and recovering his usual air of manliness, he told her that he passed the lighthouse on his way home and would go that far with her. Hatsue smiled, making not the slightest effort to wipe away the tears that had flowed down her cheeks. It was as though the sun had come shining through rain, she was wearing a red sweater, blue serge slacks and red velvet socks, the split-toed kind worn with clogs. Hatsue leaned over the concrete parapet at the edge of the roof and looked down at the sea. What's this building? she asked. Shinji too went to the parapet but at a little distance from the girl. It used to be a target observation tower, he answered. They watched from here to see where the cannon shells landed. Here, on the south side of the island, screened by the mountain, there was no wind. The sunlit expanse of the Pacific stretched away beneath their eyes. The pine-clad cliff dropped abruptly to the sea. Its jutting rocks stained white with cormorant droppings, and the water near the base of the cliff cliff was black-brown from the seaweed growing on the ocean floor. Shinji pointed to a tall rock just offshore where the surging waves were striking, sending up clouds of spray. That's called Black Isle, he explained. It's where policeman Suzuki was fishing when the waves washed him away and drowned him. Shinji was thoroughly happy, but the time was drawing near when Hatsue was due at the lighthouse. Straightening up from the concrete parapet, she turned towards Shinji. I'll be going now, she said. Shinji made no answer, and a surprised look came over his face. He'd caught sight of a black streak that ran straight across the front of her red sweater. Hatsue followed his gaze and saw the dirty smudge, just in the spot where she'd been leaning her breast against the concrete parapet. Bending her head, she started slapping her breast with her open hands. Beneath her sweater, which all but seemed to be concealing some firm supports, two gently swelling mounds were set to trembling ever so slightly by the brisk brushing of her hands. Shinji stared in wonder. Struck by her hands, the breasts seemed more like two small, playful animals. The boy was deeply stirred by the resilient softness of their movements. The streak of dirt was finally brushed out. Shinji went first down the concrete steps, and Hatsue followed, her clogs making very clear, light sounds which echoed from the four walls of the ruins. But the sounds behind Shinji's back came to a stop as they were reaching the first floor. Shinji looked back. The girl was standing there, laughing. What is it? he asked. I'm dark too, but you, you're practically black. What? You've really been burnt by the sun, you have. The boy laughed in meaningless reply and went on down the stairs. They were just about to leave the tower when he stopped abruptly and ran back inside. He'd almost forgotten his mother's bundles. On the way back toward the lighthouse, Shinji walked in front, carrying the mountain of pine needles on his back. 
As they walked along, the girl asked him his name, and now, for the first time, he introduced himself. But he went on hurriedly to ask that she not mention his name to anyone, or say anything about having met him here. Shinji well knew how sharp the villagers' tongues could be. Hatsue promised not to tell. Thus, their well-founded fear of the village's love of gossip changed what was but an innocent meeting into a thing of secrecy between the two of them. Shinji walked on in silence, having no idea how they could meet again, and soon they reached the spot from which they could look down upon the lighthouse. He pointed out the shortcut leading down to the rear of the lighthouse keeper's residence and told her goodbye. Then, purposely, he took the roundabout way on down to the village.